Welcome, I'm Andrea Fiorello, Head of Research and Reader Services at the Reading Public Library. Tonight's discussion is part of our series, The Vote, Exploring Voting Rights in the United States, sponsored by a grant from Massachusetts Humanities. We're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, which was the outcome of a decades long hard fought battle to gain federal voting rights for women. We're also using the centennial to examine who else is lacking representation and enfranchisement, both historically <coughs> and in the present. I want to give a shout out to my colleague, Melissa Selden, if you can turn your camera on, if you don't already have it on, she's gonna be on hand to help out. If you have questions as the lecture progresses, just throw them at the, in the chat box and we'll either get to them in the moment or wait till the end. Um, and a special shout out to the Vote Project Scholar, Paula Austin. Um, Paula, can you, can you show your face for a minute? Are you there? All right, well, she might show her face. Um, she is uh, the BU Professor of History and African American Studies, who will be our on our virtual stage in two weeks to discuss the women's suffrage movement in Massachusetts. Um, I'm gonna put the link to sign up for that in the chat box. Um, on this Constitution Day, I want to remind you all to remind all your people to go online or call and fill out the census. The deadline has been cut short by a month to September 30th. If you live within the states or territories, you count, and your completed census means more representation and resources for you and your neighbors. And if you have full voting rights, please fully use them in every election. Tonight's guest, Julian Goh, is professor of sociology at the University of Chicago. He has published extensively on US colonialism, social theory, and post-colonial thought. His book, American Empire and the Politics of Meaning, won the Mary Douglas Prize and was a finalist for a Philippine National Book Award. His scholarship has won prizes from the American Sociological Association, the Eastern Sociological Society, the American Political Science Association, and the International Studies Association, among others. Welcome, Professor Goh. Thank you, um, and thank you, um, Andrea, for putting this together and for inviting me. Um, it's my great honor to be here. Thanks also to um, Mass Humanities for sponsoring this, this great series. It sounds like a really fantastic series and a really important one. Um, I'm gonna talk to you today um, about voting rights um, and other rights in regards to the territories. And I wanna begin um, in 2017. Uh, before COVID, it seems like ages ago now. Um, and specifically, I wanna begin with the, the fallout from Hurricane Maria in September of 2017. Um, the hurricane, of course, devastated uh, Puerto Rico and, and the people of Puerto Rico were seeking aid from the federal government, much in the same way that the people of New Orleans would uh, seek aid after Hurricane Katrina, or really the way in which any people in any part of the United States devastated by a natural disaster might seek federal aid. Um, the thing is, President Donald Trump, rather than facilitating the smooth flow of aid, actually became very antagonistic, right? He did provide aid eventually. He also uh, went down to the island to famously and almost callously toss paper towels at needy aid recipients. Um, but thereafter, he kind of embarked upon a, a campaign to criticize the island's leaders, right? He charged them with being ungrateful and with mismanaging federal funds. Um, and, and throughout, he um, used his Twitter account and, and other platforms to essentially suggest that the Puerto Rico was some kind of foreign place. For example, in one of his tweets, um, he, he said that the hurricane ravaged island's politicians only take from the USA. Um, he said that Puerto Rico will continue to hurt our farmers and states with these massive payments. Um, and you know, Trump and his administration repeatedly made these distinctions, basically separating Puerto Rico and its people from the United States as if they were actual separate countries, right? Speaking of our farmers and states, um, talking about people from Puerto Rico taking from the USA. This, of course, raised some debate on social media and the press, um, and it raised all sorts of questions uh, that people were asking. Right? Isn't Puerto Rico a part of the United States, people wondered. Um, aren't Puerto Ricans already US 
citizens? And these are important questions because, you know, if, for example, Puerto Rico is a part of the United States, then it can't be that Puerto Rico was taking from the USA, as Trump claimed, right? That'd be like saying USA was taking from the USA. And if Puerto Ricans were US citizens, they couldn't be taking from our farmers, as Trump had claimed, they would just be taking from their own farmers. So I, I begin this, this, this debate because it raises one of the questions um, I'd like us to consider tonight. Is in fact Puerto Rico part of the United States and are Puerto Ricans US citizens? These are of course very straightforward questions, but it's amazing that many of us don't know the answers. Um, in 2017, for instance, a poll of Americans on the mainland showed that 41% of respondents said they did not believe that Puerto Ricans were US citizens. 15% were not sure. Only 43% answered that Puerto Ricans were US citizens. So people are confused and there is a, 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 an answer here. There is a real answer, um, but it's not a simple one. On one level, the answer is yes, right? Puerto, Rican, Puerto Rico is part of the United States and Puerto Ricans are US citizens. Let there be no doubt about it. But that simple answer is somewhat deceiving. Uh, because it covers up the more complex and nuanced part of the story. And that part of the story would tell us that yes, Puerto Rico is part of the United States and yes, Puerto Ricans are US citizens, but that Puerto Rico is not an equal part of the United States and that Puerto Ricans are not fully equal US citizens. In other words, the larger story is that if you're born in Puerto Rico, you are born in the USA, but you're also not. So this contradiction is something I want to talk about today, this curious status of Puerto Rico and this curious citizenship um, of, of Puerto Ricans. And what we'll see more precisely is that yes, Puerto Ricans are citizens, but they are ultimately treated uh, by the US government um, and legally as inferior citizens. They are what I would call colonial citizens um, with colonial citizenship only. This is a citizenship that is tragically lesser than regular citizenship and Trump's ill will and almost racist attitude towards Puerto Rico is merely one manifestation of this type of colonial relationship, uh, of this type of colonial citizenship. Uh, there's a broader history here. There's a bigger story of which Trump's attitude is merely the latest episode. So I want to talk to you uh, about this broader history, this bigger story. And one of the many interesting things about it is that it's not only about Puerto Rico. It's about a whole range of other peoples who, like Puerto Ricans, have been relegated to inferior status within America's presumably egalitarian and democratic polity. So um, I'd like to start first by talking a little bit more about what exactly this colonial citizenship means. Um, then I'll broaden the scope to discuss how it applies to other US territories besides Puerto Rico, territories that, um, as we'll see, span, in fact, the entire globe. And then finally, I'll provide some historical context and explanation for how we got to this uh, type of citizenship in the first place. So first, what is colonial citizenship? What do I mean by this term? Well, the easiest way to think about it is that this is a citizenship, but it's uh, of an inferior lesser status. It's a kind of secondary citizenship brought about through a whole history of colonial expansion and colonial rule, which I'll discuss in a moment. And it manifests then an exclusionary status. Colonial citizenship means that you're part of a nation, but you're also excluded in some crucial ways from it. Colonial citizenship, in other words, means unequal citizenship. It means that you as a colonial citizen get some basic protections afforded to you as a citizen, but not all. You were not in fact treated equally to as other citizens in the system are. So in what sense are say Puerto Rican residents colonial citizens? Well, you have to first recognize the sense in which Puerto Rico is a dependent colony of the United States empire, much like America was a colony of the British empire before it gained its independence. Puerto Rico is not a state in the union, nor is it an independent nation. It is what the Supreme Court long ago deemed an unincorporated territory of the United States. It is part of the United States, like say Massachusetts, but unlike Massachusetts, it's not an equal part of the United States. It is foreign in a domestic sense, as the Supreme Court long ago declared it. This means that Puerto Rico is a component of the American system, but it is considered a foreign and domestic component at once, right? Um, and that sounds paradoxical, of course, and that's because it is. And that's in many ways how colonialism, I would suggest, works. 
So how exactly is colonial citizenship um, unequal citizenship? Well, it essentially means that Puerto Rico is subject to the power and control of the United States federal government, but it doesn't fully partake of its democratic system. It's excluded from it. The US federal government makes all kinds of decisions for Puerto Rico, much in the same way that the federal government has some amount of control over Massachusetts. But unlike Massachusetts, Puerto Rico does not have equal representation in that federal government. Despite having a population of over 3 million, surpassing nearly half of all US states, Puerto Rico does not have a voting representative in Congress. It has what is called a resident commissioner in Congress who goes to Congress but has no vote. And again, this is very much like America before the American Revolution. Great Britain had control over the 13 colonies, but Americans themselves had no direct representation in the English parliament. So the US federal government, um, that is Congress and the president, can do things like make economic policy for Puerto Rico, um, the US dollar is Puerto Rico's currency. US federal regulators oversee Puerto Rico businesses. Um, and US laws dictate trade policy. Residents pay most federal taxes. In fact, their contributions in 2016 constituted $3.6 billion going into the hands of the federal government. But Puerto Rican residents do not get to determine what those policies are because they have no representation in Congress, nor do they get to vote for the US president. Even though Trump could, if he wanted, send Puerto Ricans to war to fight for the United States, Puerto Rican residents do not get to vote for the US president. And in fact, so dominated is Puerto Rico by the US government that it can't even decide on its own whether it wants to be a state or whether it wants to be independent. If it wanted to be independent, for instance, it would have to get permission from the US Congress. So Puerto Rico periodically will have plebiscites and poll its residents. Do you want to become a state? Do you want to become independent? None of which has any binding, um, uh, anything binding about it at all, in fact. They, Puerto Ricans could vote overwhelmingly for independence. They could vote overwhelmingly for statehood. But Congress ultimately decides. And again, Puerto Ricans have no representation in Congress. So this is what I'm calling colonial citizenship. It means that you're a citizen of the United States, but only in the most minimal sense. You do get to claim basic rights in the Constitution, such as those called fundamental rights or those in the Bill of Rights, but you don't get full rights. You don't get to have representation in the political body that rules you. You don't get to decide who ultimately makes your policies for you, policies that can even send you to war. So that's just a little bit of what I mean by colonial citizenship. But um, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a bigger picture here. In fact, Puerto Rico is not the only territory of the United States that exists in this colonial status. Today, as we speak, the United States has a total of five inhabited US territories that occupy this status. Puerto Rico is one, the others are American Samoa, Guam, the Northern Mariana Islands, and, and the US Virgin Islands. These territories, whose populations add up to a total of about 4 million people, are also labeled unincorporated territories. And they too operate in similar ways as Puerto Rico does, with the residents put into the status of colonial citizenship. They pay various taxes and are subject to the control of the US federal government, but they do not have voting rights. And they cannot send representatives to Congress that have voting rights, and they cannot vote for the US president. Um, one exception here is American Samoa, where colonial citizenship takes a somewhat different form. Residents of American Samoa, instead of being U.S. citizens, are classified as non-citizen U.S. nationals. Non-citizen U.S. nationals. Um, and their passports read, um, the bearer is a United States national and not a United States citizen. Now, in 2019, a case was brought up in the courts, and it was decided that Samoans should be US citizens, but that's actually still up in the air. The debate is ongoing um, through the judicial system, and it's a complex and live issue. But for our purposes, the point is that overall, American Samoa is like Puerto Rico and Guam and the US Virgin Islands. Um, it's essentially a colony of the US empire. The peoples there are reduced to a secondary status without voting privileges and without representation. And many of these colonial citizens, again, as I would call them, in fact, have risked their lives for the US, even though the US treats them as colonial subjects. 
For example, from 2001 to around 2015, 20,000 military service members from the territories of Puerto Rico, Guam, Samoa, and the Virgin Islands were deployed um, in Iraq and Afghanistan. 15,000 of these soldiers were from Puerto Rico alone, and hundreds died during the Iraq War. They're serving in the American army, um, commanded by a government that actually they have no say over. And this, in fact, is a common pattern of empires historically. Um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the British Empire manned much of its army from its colonial subjects, such as thousands upon thousands from India. Um, and today in the United States, what I'm suggesting here, it's a very similar situation. A commander in chief, the president and a Congress commands people to war, but those people have no say in electing those leaders. Now, <clears throat> some of us might find this somewhat difficult to apprehend because when we think of citizenship, we think of a, a category that, that renders everyone equal. Um, we might also find it difficult to apprehend because we tend to think of the United States as a beacon of liberty and freedom and equality so much so that I don't think many people realize that we have something like colonial citizenship, that we have, in fact, colonies, that the United States is very much a traditional empire uh, in, in this sense, and very much not unlike the British empire that the Americans in 1776 sought to overthrow. So this um, opens up this question, how did we get here, right? Um, and what I'd like to do is spend the rest of my time um, to think about this historically, talk a little bit about the history of these territories, the history of this empire. And after that, I'll connect this empire to other populations. And what we'll see when we expand our scope in this way is that the exclusions manifested by colonial citizenship and, and US empire is really not an aberration, but is in some ways is characteristic of US history. So um, the history, how did we get here? Um, now, most of the territories that we have today were first taken by the US um, over 100 years ago, um, as the United States began expanding overseas in the late 19th century. And this was a relatively new thing for the United States. I say relatively because, of course, prior to the late 19th century, the United States had already been expanding, right? The 13 territories um, had expanded westward, um, acquiring all kinds of new territories along the way, displacing um, or eradicating indigenous populations, fighting off other powers who had previously laid claims to these territories, such as Spain and France. Um, and in these cases, America's um, acquired territories became equal states in the Union, right? The United States seized them, and eventually those territories were split up into states. That's how we have Texas, New Mexico, California, Utah, where all the residents are equal citizens. But at the turn of the US, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, the United States began a new phase of its imperial career by going overseas and taking new territories overseas. In 1898, the United States declared sovereignty over Hawaii and the former Spanish colonies of Puerto Rico, Guam, Cuba, and the Philippines. Um, in 1900, it took half of Samoa, now known as American Samoa. Germany took the other half. In 1917, the United States took the Virgin Islands, which at that time had about 26,000 inhabitants. So this was when America's overseas empire started. The United States purchased or seized these territories in the early 20th century, creating this overseas, a vast overseas empire. Then from this point, there were three paths. One was statehood. The United States could have granted these territories statehood just as they had granted the earlier territories that it acquired on the frontier. But this of course only happened for Hawaii and not until actually 1951, so a very long time. That was one option. The other option was full independence. The United States could have taken these territories and then let them go, given them independence. This only happened for the Philippines. The US granted independence to the Philippines in 1946. So it ruled the Philippines uh, up until, officially up until 1946. Um, and it, it let Cuba obtain its independence, even though the United States kind of created what we sometimes call an informal colonialism in Cuba with um, laws allowing the United States military to come down and intervene as it wished. But nominally, at least, Cuba and the Philippines were given independence. Now, the third path was what happened for all of the other territories. The third path was good old fashioned colonialism. Um, and there's a couple things we have to keep in mind here to understand this. 
First, we should understand why the United States was interested in these places um, at all. For each colony, of course, there were different stories and different reasons, but in general, I'd point to two main reasons for acquiring these colonies and creating this empire. The first is uh, economics. The United States needed new markets for its products, and so territorial expansion was one solution. Um, at, the, at, the, at the same time, some of these colonies were prized for their resources and cheap, cheap labor. Puerto Rico, for instance, soon became the site of massive US corporate investment in sugar. Uh, this is an image of some sugarcane workers in Puerto Rico in the early 20th century. Um, before the Americans came, in fact, there had been a large uh, indigenous sugar industry in Puerto Rico, um, but American colonialism ended all that. Eventually, by the 1930s, American sugar companies had come down from the mainland, drove out the peasant population, and, and drove out locally owned agricultural firms and replaced them all with its own sugar plantations. So economics was an important part of this new empire. The second interest um, was geopolitical. The colonies uh, would not only provide economic benefits, but for uh, American officials, they thought of strategic benefits. Guam and Samoa, for instance, became important for America's expanding network of naval bases, right? The United States before World War I did not have a strong army, did not have a strong navy. Um, it was just beginning to expand its military. And in terms of its naval power, it was very weak. It needed um, bases in the Pacific. So Hawaii and Guam and Samoa uh, became important. And in fact, Guam and Samoa became essentially colonial naval bases. They were run for decades essentially as one big uh, American Navy base. Um, they did not get a civilian colonial administration, in fact, and were put into complete control of the US Navy. Here's just an image of one Naval commander um, who basically is assigned to be the Naval commander of the base, but also by the same token became the de facto colonial governor of the island, its legislature and its judicial branch as well. Um, so in Guam and Samoa, they basically became um, entire naval bases controlled autocratically right, by one person, the, uh, the, 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 the naval commander appointed by the president. Um, the other thing we have to understand is the status. right? So this is where this term colonialism, colonial citizenship, all of this comes from. You have to understand the question of what these territories were when the US required them was actually indeterminate at the time. The United States declared sovereignty over them, but their status was unclear, right? Were they residents, uh, were the residents of these territories automatically US citizens? Does the constitution, in other words, follow the flag? And ultimately a series of Supreme Court cases had to decide the issue. Um, here's the Supreme Court in 1901, the Supreme Court that essentially decided the issue through a series of cases known as the insular cases. Um, and through these cases, the Supreme Court essentially invented a new category, a new status category, this category of unincorporated territory. What the Supreme Court did was say, well, when we expanded on the West, um, those were territories that were incorporated, meaning that they were territories that were temporarily subject to US control, but that we knew that they would eventually become equal states in the union with the residents enjoying full citizenship status, including voting rights. And again, this is how New Mexico, Arizona, California eventually became states. They initially underwent, underwent a long period where the United States ruled them and the residents didn't have full citizenship. But after that period, they, the idea was that these places would eventually become equal states and they did become equal states in the union. But the acquisition of the Philippines, Puerto Rico and Guam and these other territories generated a problem for the American government. What would they become? Um, the Supreme Court had to figure this out. And a lot of Americans at the time were frightful that these places might become states in the union like California had or New Mexico, right? Why were they scared? Um, simply put, because of racism. They believed that the residents of these islands were less developed, were backwards, even savage and barbarian. They thought of them as part of the inferior races. Um, here's one popular image at the time. Um, here's another popular image. Um, I don't know if you can see that's supposed to be, you know, representation of Puerto Rico and, and um, the Philippines. 
Um, and here's one that appeared in the Boston Sunday Globe. Um, this is supposed to be images of Filipinos and you can see that they've rendered them, the artist has rendered them basically like um, African Americans. So Americans were, you know, they were racist at the time and they thought of these territories as filled with people who they did not want to be part of equal parts of the United States. They didn't want these people. They didn't believe that they were equal human beings, really. They, they thought of them as inferior, incapable of democratic self-government and so on. Um, and so the pre Supreme Court essentially came to the same decision. The Supreme Court said that these new places were fundamentally different from the territories that the United States had acquired on the Western frontier and that eventually became states precisely because their inhabitants were of a different race. They were of the undeveloped or lesser, lesser races. Um, governing them according to Anglo-Saxon principles, the Supreme Court decided could not be possible. In other words, the constitution could not follow the flag in this case. Um, the Supreme Court said, in some cases, the natural gravitation of small bodies, these are small territories, towards large ones and others, the result of a successful war and still others, may bring about conditions which would render the annexation of distant possessions desirable. If those possessions are inhabited by alien races, differing us from us in religion, customs, laws, and methods of taxation and modes of thought, the administration of government and justice, according to Anglo-Saxon principles, may for a time be impossible. Um, now, this was uh, from a case, uh, Downs versus Bidwell in 1901, specifically about Puerto Rico, and it applied to others. But um, the conclusion was for Puerto Rico this. We are therefore of the opinion that the island of Puerto Rico is a territory appurtenant and belonging to the United States, but not a part of the United States. In other words, not an equal part of the United States. Um, and so the precedent applied uh, to all other territories, and the bottom line again was this. While the United States wanted these territories for various reasons, for its economic gain and geopolitical gain, it did not want these territories to be equal states in the Union. Um, and so again, the, the Supreme Court declared them to be unlike the territories that the United States had acquired on the Western frontier. They would not become states. They would be subject to whatever Congress decided um, of them. Um, Congress was to maintain full power and control, and the US president was to maintain power and control over them um, without any um, democratic representation. At most, what the United States said it would do was rule these places as colonies and civilize them, right? Maybe teach them how to be self-governing subjects so that maybe one day, maybe in the long distant future, they might become good enough, developed enough, advanced enough to become equal states in the Union, or good enough, advanced enough to become fully independent nations living on their own. Um, and this is the whole rationale for American colonial control over the Philippines, over Guam, over Samoa, over, the Phil uh, over Puerto Rico, this idea that America would take these colonies, but like children, would raise them up so that one day they would be independent. And again, this, this metaphor of childhood was crucial. It was part of the racial way of thinking um, that equated actually um, dark uh, brown and, and black and yellow people um, with children who needed adult supervision. So this was how the new category of unincorporated territory was born and with it was born the current US overseas empire. This was a sprawling, expansive overseas network of colonies around the globe, which various US interests wanted to keep and control for economic and political reasons, but which did not want to grant equal status to. Um, and the residents were not given even, even citizenship initially. Eventually they were given citizenship, but it was this colonial citizenship that I just mentioned. Uh, Puerto Rico, for example, officially um, was given, uh, its residents were given citizenship by the 1917 um, Jones Act, passed by Congress and signed by Wilson in 1917. Um, it gave Puerto Ricans finally its limited citizenship status, um, which was better than their previous status, but was really not equal status at all. Um, and the only reason, in fact, why the U.S. did this, right, why did it bother to even give this limited citizenship, was because of World War I. The United States wanted to draft Puerto Ricans to help fight in the war, and to do so, they made them U.S. citizens. As citizens, they could easily join the U.S. Army. And initially, very few Puerto Ricans signed up for the war. 
But then President Wilson, two months after signing the Jones Act, signed a compulsory military service act. And so 20,000 Puerto Ricans were eventually drafted to serve in World War I. Puerto Rican soldiers were sent to guard the Panama Canal, the important waterway, which was also a kind of colony. Um, uh, Puerto Rican regiments were also sent to the Western Front, including the 396th Infantry Regiment of Puerto Rico created in uh, New York City, whose members earned the nickname the Harlem Hellfighters. Um, and again, um, all these were all, uh, these were regiments manned by Puerto Ricans who did not have full citizenship. So to close out this part of the story, um, I'd like to add one more final thing, and that is that um, one of the tragic things about this history is that the inhabitants of these territories, and particularly, again, take the example of Puerto Rico, they really did want to become um, citizens. They really did want full statehood. In fact, when the United States Army first arrived in 1898 to drive out Spain, the Americans were actually surprised at how welcoming the Puerto Rican people were. They welcomed the American forces with open arms. Um, they invited them in. They, they really wanted Americans there. And you know, when, when you dig into the history, what you find is that the reason why they wanted Americans there is because they believed that by the Americans taking them as a territory, they would eventually become a state in the Union. Uh, Puerto Rican leaders were telling their people, you know, let's become a state of the Union. This is great. We've become like the Western territories on the frontier. We're going to be just like them um, and, and, and we'll eventually become states and equal citizens. Um, so Puerto Rico welcomed the United States on this false promise that they would one day be treated as the residents of the territories on the Western frontier did. And it ended up being a false promise. As I mentioned, uh, the Supreme Court decided no you're not going to get that status. Um, as a result, when Puerto Rican political leaders in the early 1900s realized that they weren't going to get uh, statehood, um, when they realized that American racism was too strong, that they wouldn't be allowed, that they would be treated differently than the territories on the West were treated, that's when um, a national independence movement started for the, really for uh, uh, the first time, um, it was in response to the lack of statehood. Um, so eventually this nationalist Puerto Rican movement grew out of disillusionment. Um, and this is an image of the famous Puerto Rican nationalist leader, Pedro Abizo Campos, who actually um, studied at Harvard, came to Boston when, when, when he was younger. Um, and in fact, the stories have it that in Boston, he met with um, the Irish community and Irish nationalist leaders in, in Boston as well, you know, many of them in, of course, in, in, in Saudi. And um, he got inspired for his nationalist movement from, from the Irish, actually. So uh, the independence movement in Puerto Rico was born only after the United States tragically denied statehood to Puerto Rico. For Puerto Rican nationalists, since the United States would not give them statehood, the only way out of colonialism was um, complete independence. And as the years wore on, as the United States repeatedly denied statehood to Puerto Rico, the independence movement grew and grew and it became more violent. In fact, by the 1950s, the nationalist movement had resorted to terrorist attacks on the United States. In 1954, um, four Puerto Rican nationalists shot 30 rounds from semi-automatic pistols in Washington, DC in the House of Representatives. They wanted to highlight their desire for Puerto Rico independence from US rule. The nationalists were Lolita Lebron, Rafael Cancel Mirada, uh, Miranda, Andres Figueroa Cordero, and Irvin Flores Rodriguez. They unfurled a Puerto Rican flag in the House of Representatives and they began shooting. Uh, five representatives were wounded, one seriously and all recovered. This is an image of uh, the chamber of the House of Representatives and you can see up uh, the nationalists positioned themselves uh, on the upper decks and, and opened fire from there. Um, the assailants were arrested, tried and convicted in federal court, uh, given life imprisonment. Um, it wasn't until 1978 when Jimmy Carter actually pardoned them and they all returned to Puerto Rico. Now, this was a violent and horrific act, but again, I'm trying to give it some context. It only came after decades upon decades of the United States seizing Puerto Rico against the will of its inhabitants and refusing to give Puerto Ricans equal citizenship and equal statehood. Um, this is not meant to be an excuse for this terrorist act. It's meant to be an explanation um, uh, and, and to point out colonialism generates anti-colonial violence. 
So that's just some of this big history as to how we got here. Um, there's always more to tell. There's lots of complexities and, and I can't cover them all. Um, and, and so as I'm running short of time, what I'd like to do with the remaining few minutes, as I mentioned before I would do, is expand the lens even further and contextualize this territorial empire um, uh, and its unequal citizenship within the larger history of American citizenship and voting rights. Because in many ways, the story of colonial citizenship and the non-life representation is not an aberration from American history, but it's just another instance of them. And of course, we have the issue of women's voting rights, um, which you could say was a kind of colonial citizenship. Um, but there's also a whole series of other populations in American history that have been subject to the same logic of colonial citizenship, part of a larger pattern whereby the labor and resources of racialized populations are continually exploited, but equal citizenship is continually denied. For instance, if you go back to the um, Western empire that I mentioned, this period of Western expansion in the 19th century, before the United States seized Puerto Rico, the Philippines, Guam, and Samoa, um, these, you know, these were territories, as I mentioned, that eventually became states, but most of the residents that were white became equal citizens, but many other residents as the United States expanded westward were not given um, equal representation. And in fact, one of the things the Supreme Court did in, in 1901 when it said, you know, we can deny Puerto Rico, for example, uh, we can deny them citizenship is point to these earlier precedents. And the Supreme Court said, look, we've been doing this a lot. We've been doing this in our whole history. Um, and what they pointed to was um, the whole history of unequal citizenship. Um, slavery, of course, is the clearest example, but um, if you go back to this, this is the Northwest Territory, the Northwest Ordinance. This was the act of Congress that created the, 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 the nation's first organized incorporated territory. Um, and eventually, as we know, the areas became equal states in the Union. Um, but what this act said about citizenship is very interesting. It initially offered citizenship to everyone but it was soon changed. The 1790 Uniform Rule of Naturalization passed by Congress restricted naturalization to free whites only. And so with this legislation, the United States was given the distinction of being the first independent nation in the Americas that introduced racial criteria for naturalization. And in practice, it meant that only Europeans or Anglo-Saxons could become equal citizens. It meant by the same token that non-Europeans and non-Anglo-Saxons living in the US were denied certain rights and privileges that were afforded other citizens, such as the right to vote for political representatives or for certain federal social benefits. They could all be denied the full protection of the constitution. They were second class citizens at best. Um, and the laws would change over time as the American expanded further westward. There's a whole complex history to them. Um, but Officially, the racial restriction, in fact, uh, that the, the, these ordinances in 1790 brought, the racial restriction was not officially eliminated entirely until 1952. And so before then, these early laws contributed to, for instance, the, uh, the prevention of Native Americans from becoming full citizenship, citizens with voting representation. Um, by various Supreme Court decisions, in fact, Native Americans were considered dependent upon the US federal government, but were also considered alien, and so not full citizens. This would not change until 1924, and even then full citizenship was not forthcoming for all Native Americans due to various state level laws. Um, or take Asian Americans, as I hope you all know, Chinese immigrants had been coming to the US quite early on for a long time. And they had been the main source of labor for building America. Their labor helped build the transcontinental railroad. About 20,000 Chinese immigrants, for instance, made the railroads. They made up 90% of the workforce on the Central Pacific Line, for instance. But because of the 1790 Naturalization Act, these Chinese immigrants could not become citizens because of their race. Now, again, there's a whole complex story here and other, many other minority groups to discuss. But my overarching point um, is that colonial citizenship was created pretty early on in America's history. And it was from the beginning a racial matter. It was from the beginning racialized. It was about excluding people from full citizenship on the basis of their race. And so um, to conclude, what I'm trying to point out here is that the anomalous status of Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans today is really 
not that anomalous, right? The way in which Donald Trump marginalized Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans with his, his insinuation that they are not really Americans is just one recent example of a longstanding um, and longstanding practice of the US government. The US has long excluded people from full citizenship. It has extended control over new territories, sought to rule new people. It has brought in immigrants like the Chinese into the country, but it has not treated them equally. It has tried to use new territories and peoples for their resources and for their labor, exploiting human energy and life for its own particular interests and purposes, but it doesn't always offer them full citizenship in exchange. The American empire has taken a lot, but it has not been very good about giving back. So I, you know, to conclude, I hope that those of us who do enjoy the vote and do enjoy full citizenship privileges do our best to actually exercise those privileges. And again, this is uh, the real tragic thing to me about this whole story. For over a century now, many Puerto Ricans and other colonized peoples have sought equal citizenship. They've sought the right to vote. We have denied them that. And all the while, we citizens who deny them the vote ourselves do not vote, right? Uh, only 56% of the US voting age population cast ballots in the 2016 presidential election. That's just over half eligible voters. And to me, that's just as tragic as colonial citizenship. Um, so I'll end there. Thank you so much for listening and for your attention. Thank you, Julian. You covered a lot. Um, in, you packed a lot in a short time. A lot of horrific history right there. Um, I, hi, there's our project scholar, Paula Austin. Hello, Paula, do you wanna say hi? Sure. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Julian. Julian did a lot of history. So I'm like, yes, I don't have to do that next month. <laughs> well, you might, you might get a new audience, but um, I might be the only one who, you know, got to, got to hear all that. Um, so I am going to open it up for, for, for questions. Um, I, and I'm going to start off with a not very well formed question, but something I always think about. I'm a member, a, a white uh, Western state member of Gen um, X. And uh, I can say that my history books and um, not just the straight out text, but also the narrative and rationalization around um, US history, our march towards progress, our march always towards a more perfect union um, and equality and justice for all. Um, is I, I feel like we've we've made in some areas a move towards a better educational approach for the next generation of Americans, but very, very little. And until we get the history straight um, from a narrative perspective that includes um, uh, many more voices and, and much more honesty, um, it's very hard for us to understand and grapple with the moment we're in or to ever have that more perfect union. So I know you write a lot for adults and you, you lecture a lot to college students. Um, what do you have to say about teaching even younger audiences a more truthful American narrative? Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I, I wish I actually talked to more high school students and junior high students, um, because I would love to know, you know, what they're doing in their textbooks and what they learn. Um, um, you know, I talked to college students and, you know, it's interesting because I, I feel like at least the, you know, the college students I interact and if you go to college, you're privileged. And I, I feel like a lot of them do understand at least this history. And if they don't know it, they at least can understand that it's, it's true. I, I just feel like there's something about the earlier history lessons that kids are getting, as you, Andrea, mentioned, um, that is sort of somehow preventing them from really grappling with this full history or, um, or reacting to it in a way that, you know, a lot of people react to on the right today, which is if you talk about the true history, you're somehow un-American, right? Or you're somehow um, not fully American, which is a really... <laughs> A contradictory stance um, and I, it's, it's really this I think that kind of rhetoric is the real challenge for me is to somehow be able to address those criticisms that 
say, you know, if you talk about this history, if you, if, if you criticize the United States in any way, you're not being nationalist enough, you're being un-American. I just, I don't understand that. And I wish I did. Um, but I think that attitude is the biggest um, barrier. And, you know, maybe Paula has something to say about this too. But um, I do feel like that is one of the biggest barriers to a wider acceptance of these narratives and these stories and, and acceptance of these voices. Um, somehow that attitude is, it's a, it's a, it's an attitude of wanting to be ignorant about history. And I, I guess I just don't understand that. So I actually don't have any answers for, um, you know, how, how we can better spread this history. It's really, it's something that's always troubled me. Uh, Paula, I welcome you to jump in, but also if, if someone doesn't want to ask a question verbally, throw it in the chat. Um, we, will be, we will be reading your questions from the chat box. I do have a question, Julian. Thank you so much for that, for that presentation. Um, I mean, my first question we could talk about separately. I need to know how you put the slides behind you. So let, you know, I, I'm going to, I need to get that information. Um, but my real question is about, I mean, you've sort of traced a history of essentially sort of gatekeeping citizenship and the sort of rights and privileges of citizenship, right? Oh, right. In the U.S. and then in terms of the U.S.'s relationship um, with, you know, its, its colonial holdings. And I wonder if you, um, I don't know, have some thoughts about what, I mean, it's, this is probably, there's probably a complex answer to this. And so, and I'm happy to hear a complex answer, but what do you attribute that gatekeeping to? I mean, it's, it, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was thinking about the War of 1812 and like who comes out of that as being able to get some voting rights. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, do you have a, is there something that you say about this history of gatekeeping essentially around that and kind of what it's about? Um, yeah, I, I appreciate that question. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, it's, you know, it's almost simple. Um, it's about a long history of racism being baked into the attitudes um, of, of expansionists, right? Um, uh, I, I, I think that that racism is so deep and so profound. And of course we, uh, in our history textbooks, you know, we're happy to talk about slavery. We're happy to talk about racism against African-Americans. Um, um, but it becomes harder to talk about racism when it comes to other groups. And it becomes harder, I think, to go beyond the black white binary, even though that's important. I think that um, the, the racism, and it's a very complex form of racism, right? That, that, that has impacted Asian Americans, for example, or Native Americans. Um, it comes with different types of stereotyping and different practices. Um, and I think it's that history of that kind of racism that, that I think drives a lot of this and that we really have to understand. I mean, this is really the big difference between you know, why Hawaii becomes a state and Puerto Rico doesn't. Hawaii becomes a state because it was basically treated like a big settlement colony for a lot of white populations. And so the white populations go there and they become the vocal voice and they say they demand statehood. When you come to Puerto Rico, uh, for example, um, in, at, at the same time, um, the population is primarily brown and black. Um, and there aren't a lot of American residents and settlers there. It just didn't become a destination. And, and so the, the Supreme Court and, and Congress sees it as, you know, uh, a fear of a black state, right? Um, and, it, and, and so racism really drives a lot of this. Um, and, I, you know, it's racism coupled with America's need for cheap labor and resources, right? So American capitalism expanding and sort of needing cheap labor and resources, but not wanting the human beings behind it all. Um, so I think that that racism has to be part of the story. And again, I think that we're just starting to grapple with that type of racism that goes beyond just the racism that brought about the horrible tragedy of this slavery. Um, and I think we need to think about all of these forms of racism and all these different groups in the same frame, um, if that kind of makes sense, Paula. And you know, all, all kinds of, you know, and also um, women and, and basically all kinds of marginalized populations, right? And, this is, and it all happens through these juridical boundaries of, 
you're a citizen, but you're not, and you have some rights, but you don't have a lot. I mean, in many ways, it's a very complex juridical game. Um, and, and colonialism is all about um, these ambiguous kind of statuses and these contradictory statuses that, that become developed over time. So there's also this problematic um, legal legacy. I mean, Puerto Rican status basically is established in 1901. We still have that status. They still have that status today. That's not progress. Um, the citizenship that they have today is not over 100 years ago from the 1917 Act, just because we wanted Puerto Ricans to fight in the war. That's not progress either, right? So um, there is uh, oh, just a long history of racism, I have to say. So Professor Go, if I may ask a question. First yeah, of all, call me Julian. It's oh, important. Julian. Well, thank you very much, uh, and and thank you for participating in the discussion tonight, and especially my thanks to the Reading Public Library for hosting yet another really informative and wonderful event. I I've learned um, a a great deal um, of, of utterly depressing things from you tonight, but I am grateful to have that knowledge, and I will dig deeper. But I'm left wondering. What levers of influence do colonial citizens have to influence federal policy? Um, very little. Um, the, the only way in which colonial citizens can influence policy is if by no longer becoming colonial citizens. And it's a very complex thing because the way in which this colonial citizenship works, it's residential, it's place-based. So, if you're born in Puerto Rico, you're a Puerto Rican resident, and therefore you take the status of um, a colonial citizen. Even if, you know, say you're a white person um, from New York, um, and and you have a kid in Puerto Rico, and 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 you're, you re or you move to Puerto Rico, you automatically become part of this colonial citizenship category, which begins as a racialized category, but then now takes on its own, a life of its own. But if you're Puerto Rican from from Puerto Rico, for example, um, and then you uh, be, uh, reside in the U.S., then you actually become a U.S. resident and you can then obtain voting privileges. So um, a lot of Puerto Ricans in Florida, for instance, are being mobilized because some of those Puerto Ricans have been able to shed themselves of the colonial citizenship by having residency in the United States. Then they can vote in the United States um, system. And, and in Florida, this is a, a big battleground right now as the Puerto Ricans are anti-Trump and they're sort of countering some of the the, the longstanding Cuban forces in Florida, which had long gone Republican. So um, colonial citizens themselves actually have very little influence. The most they can do is um, try to support and work with um, people with voting power. Um, I think that in, in, in Samoa and Guam, it's a somewhat of a different story and more complex. They might have other channels, but um, they are, this is really a powerless status, unfortunately. And, and if I can be greedy for a second and ask one more question, the, the story of, of Hawaii as an exception is an interesting one, and you've shed some, some very informative light there, but you haven't brought up another former U.S. territory separated at a distance from the mainland by less, about 500 miles, but that is Alaska. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, um, how, how does Alaska present an, an exception and later gains statehood in your understanding of this? Yeah, that's also a good question. Um, Alaska, unlike Hawaii and unlike Puerto Rico, was essentially seen as a vast wilderness, right? The, the, as the you know, what we call Eskimos, the, the, those people um, weren't even seen as significant. Um, they were just seen as part of the landscape. So um, Alaska originally was thought of as uninhabited, right? Um, and, and so it becomes a state as white settler interests became uh, powerful and seeking mining rights, for example, in Alaska. And so um, the, there, was, there was, in the eyes of the people at the time, um, Alaska wasn't seen to have a huge population of non-whites. Um, the indigenous population was seen to be um, too insignificant to matter. So that, that's a, a really interesting question um, and an important one. Um, and I think the story ends up being um, similar in the sense that um, those territories that, that had uh, a significant population or a population that was seen as significant in number of, of non-whites um, were less likely to become states. And the territories that had um, a lot of uh, white settlers pressing for statehood 
or territories which had only a few settlers, but the, the, the territory itself was seen as uninhabited, those territories were more successful in becoming states. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Uh, we do have a chat question. Um, if we would like to, the, Kelly, this is from Kelly, if we would like to learn more of this history, what books and resources would you recommend, please? Um, yeah, there's actually a good book um, by, um, that came out recently by Daniel Immerwar. Um, I know, I was just trying to think of the name of that because that's how I found you, Julian. This yes. book, I was reading the bibliography and I was like, hmm. <laughs> um, yes, and it's just called something like American Empire, isn't it? I mean, it's, um, it's called, I forget now, I, and I feel bad because I read, the, I <laughs> read and commented on the book. It's called, um, uh, I'm looking it up now. I oh, oh, it's How to Hide an Empire. How to how Hide an no, Empire, no, yeah. Or is yeah. it? Yeah, how to hide an empire. How yeah. to hide an empire. Um, and it's a nice, it's a nice um, popularized way to understand this history. Um, I have a more scholarly type of like a not more scholarly, but a more complex um, that's not really open to a. Uh, 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 it's old now. It's 2011, um, but I talk about this history in a, in a broader history. Um, there are um, unfortunately not a whole lot of great books on this history. I mean, this is a history that's just becoming rediscovered and, and understood um, in new ways. Um, the, the legal history, if you're like a legal historian and all these complexities about citizenship, there's great work by um, scholars on that front too. Um, and uh, there's uh, a couple of books about these insular cases and about the um, legal history and about the, the anomalous Puerto Rico status of Puerto Rico. Um, which um, are helpful and are sort of uh, very accessible to um, these are by like legal historians and I'm trying to um, remember off the top of my head some of them but um, there's a uh, uh, Christina Duffy Burnett has uh, a couple books I could you know there's there's a whole reading list that um, I we could create actually um, I would just have to go and get them but um, you know a, a reading list that would pull together all of these different um, resources. Um, um, and as, as soon as I uh, think of a couple more of them, I'll put them in the chat. I, I just thought of another that um, I uh, read in the last few years. And it's, it's very much like a popular uh, nonfiction book called um, The True Flag by Stephen Kinsler, who is, uh, he is a journalist who writes about uh, foreign affairs and um, politics. And it's about a lot about um, the, the history of us seizing all of these territories, a lot about the Philippines, a lot about Cuba, and Teddy Roosevelt and um, his worldview around these things. And interestingly, um, uh, other celebrities of the day, including Mark Twain, who was very mm -hmm. much against US um, empire. So it, that's a very, uh, it's a, it's a yeah. non-scholarly work and yeah, very, accessible, very clear, Stephen. very accessible. I, I highly recommend it if you are of the non-scholarly bent and it's well done and I, I definitely learned things and, and highly recommend it. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great, um, Kinzer um, is, is a great resource. The other one I put in there is the, by the legal historian, Sam Ehrman on, um, Puerto Rico and the US Constitution and Empire. Because Puerto Rico really was this important case that kind of set the precedent for everything. Julian, I was thinking about um, May Nye's book that's really old now, but but that is mostly an immigration history mm -hmm. book. But I think some of the relationships that are so it's only a piece of kind of the puzzle that that you put together today, but um, gives us kind of those the kind of foreign relations uh, part, piece of it and maybe the trade the economic, the kind of market piece of it, um, and kind of, I think, then speaks a little bit to the to the, the citizenship and kind of rights and privileges that go with it. But her book is really old now. I mean, I read that in grad school, so. Yeah, yeah, and th that's a great book. Uh, there's one, I think you're talking about the right one, that, the one that I'm thinking of, Impossible Subjects. It's really great. Um, she goes into a lot of the, the, the Mexican-American experience as well, and the Chinese-American, so she goes through a lot of these populations that I began to talk to it, talk about at the end, 
Um, and so there's a real, there's, um, yeah, there's some good works on that. Um, what, what needs to be, you know, what, what would be great is for titles, books that cover all of these exclusions in the same frame, right? Where you, they talked about Puerto Rico and overseas empire and Mexican Americans and Chinese Americans. And there's not a lot of those works. Um, that would be a big, expansive, comprehensive history that someone would need to write. And yeah, unfortunately, there's not a lot of those. But thank you for that question. It's, it's, I think, having some kind of reading list. I don't know, Andrea, if you're going to generate a kind of reading list from these talks, that would be fantastic. Like, yeah, I think that's a, I think that, I mean, obviously that's right in my wheelhouse. Um, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're covering a broad swath. I mean, you, yeah. you really encapsulated a lot, but we're, we've, we've hit up a lot already and we have, um, we have many more um, subjects we're going to cover. Paula will be, Paula will be back like I said, in two weeks, and I did um, add the registration for that event in right. the chat. Um, so that is geared towards uh, Massachusetts suffrage history, as mm. well as I think we might hear a little bit from a, a scholar about New York suffrage. Oh, okay. Is that what Lauren will be talking about? And, um, and then she'll be back to discuss um, uh, the African-American uh, voting rights and um, again to discuss Shirley Chisholm and um, to uh, view the documentary about her life and her work. And a another interesting intersection between your work, Julian, and uh, Professor Austin's work is Paula has written about Washington, D.C. She just had a book come out this last year about uh, Jim Crow coming of age um, in Jim Crow DC. Um, and obviously DC is another stunning example yep. of people suffering from a lack of um, representation in our nation's capital. The irony could not be richer. Yeah. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Paula, because I know that wasn't really the focus of your work, but um, just an interesting connection. Yeah, I think listening to Julian reminded me too of like of of young people who are officially citizens but are also sort of not represented yeah. um, and don't have voting rights. And so I don't. I mean, I think this this the concept of sort of the rights and privileges. I mean, I think that's why I asked the gatekeeping question. Yeah, it's part of what you talked about. Um, was this idea about um, you know when does someone become um, able to, you know, self-govern, right? That, that concept. And I feel like that that's, and I think that's why I was thinking about, well, what, what's at stake yeah. keeping that away from people? Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, I see what you're getting at. And that is, that's, what's interesting. This is, I think in many ways, a reflection of um, liberalism, right? The, the idea that you, you have a democracy, but it depends upon liberal enlightened rational subjects. Um, and so if you're not enlightened, if you get classified as someone who, because of the race or gender or age, are incapable of the rationality um, uh, that it requires to be a good democratic citizen, then um, you're excluded. So, you know, liberal thought carries exclusions inherent in it, right? You have to define who is a worthy subject of, of who is a worthy democratic citizen, um, and you have to draw the line somewhere. And that line moves, it's race sometimes, it's gender, age, um, various other capacities. And, and that's what history is about, is these shifting, shifting lines. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I think Paula, I, it's an interesting way to put it, this gatekeeping, because the gatekeeping is in a sense um, built into the logic of, of liberal subjecthood, right? It's built into the idea of, um, of, of a liberal democracy. Yeah, and that we definitely do not talk enough about is what is inherent in liberal ideologies. Um, and I, because I, I think we think about enlightenment in this very kind of expansive and and um, kind of equitable way. But no, I think it's really, it's actually, it, there are restrictions inherent in, in it and inherent, and then it, it's, it, it infuses these legal codes that then um, restrict all, all sorts of communities. So that was great. I, I wish I had written that down. 
So if there's a space, I'd like to actually jump in again. <laughs> I have lots and lots of questions. Sure, yeah. I was uh, very interested by your comments about the various votes and referenda uh, within these territories to become states. And I'm more familiar with Puerto Rico, I guess, because they've had one recently that captured a lot of attention. But I would be interested to know a little bit more about the history of such votes in other territories and also observe that they're not exactly slam dunks from what I remember. That it's, it's not like 99% of people vote for them. And so I'm, I'm interested in why people would vote against it uh, if they have no representation in government and uh, looking forward to your response. Yeah, that's a good question. And that's a really complicated issue. I'm actually, I don't think I'm like the expert on that. Um, I think there's some political scientists who would know more about this, but um, from what I know, um, it, the the recent so the the history of of say the the Puerto Rican sort of plebiscites and so on, um, it's it's very it does tend to be divided between well so it's usually three categories: independence, statehood, or status quo, and it does tend to be equally divided. Actually, much less for independence, but that kind of goes up and down depending on on the time. But um, I think that the reason, part of the reason why people want the status quo is that there are sort of um, vested interests in, um, in, 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 in not becoming a state, at least that some people suggest. Um, I think that the, um, the, the, the Puerto Rican nationalists obviously don't wanna become a state that there's a sense in which they wanna preserve Puerto Rican identity they don't want to be subject to a kind of American sort of whitewashing of, of identity and language. Um, and so they prefer the um, independence and some of them then actually oscillate towards status quo as well, because they don't want to, uh, statehood would imply um, a, a more demand for assimilation and integration that they, they might not want. Um, there are also some who, um, want um, who, who might not like statehood because they, they see that there's certain federal benefits, um, some economic benefits. Uh, you know, Puerto Rico does pay a lot of taxes. It does have certain benefit, uh, economic benefits uh, that, 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 that some people get. Um, uh, and being a state, they, they fear will change all of those traditional benefits. Um, a place like Guam, um, a lot of the residents might do not want statehood or some of those residents who don't want statehood, for example, or independence, um, they uh, like, they, they say that they appreciate the connection with the United States, it's better than being independent, but they also don't want statehood because um, then again, it's the same cultural issue. They feel that um, they'll lose their cultural identity. And even though the United States can legislate for them, you know, the United States hasn't done too much about legislating cultural issues. Um, and, and, and language issues. So um, there's this, that element I think plays a big part, um, this identity element, that becoming a state people fear means that you lose your identity. And so they said these, some of these people prefer, um, prefer the status quo on those grounds. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex terrain. There's a lot of different interests and a lot of complex interests. A lot of it also has to do with how the, the questions are worded in these polls. Um, and and it's, it's really a complex uh, terrain that I, you know, we would have to really do more systematic analysis of. And I, I actually haven't done that analysis, but the, the sorts of things that I've heard are, are the ones that I've told you. Well, I really appreciate those insights. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I've sort of wondered if there isn't um, a strong push to suppress any move towards um, territories voting to become states, like it, it, not that they would get their way, but I mean, I, I've, I've wondered if there isn't sort of a information campaign set by the people who do have the power um, to keep things as they are, to maintain uh, political control as they see it, or maintain white supremacy, or, you know, I, I, I just wonder if it's not really framed quite right when we ask, like I know Puerto Rico did recently have a referendum on this, but I wonder about the political machinations 
working to make to tell Puerto Rico that you know you you're good how you are like I, I wonder I wonder I mean I'm not saying I know that I just um I just suspect that there might be some people in power working against that um and I think you'd be right to suspect that I mean clearly the Republican administrations over the years do not want Puerto Rico to become a state because Puerto Rico will go democratic um, and, 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 and obviously the Republican administrations don't want that. Now, how that translates into whatever, they, whatever campaigns they might lead to prevent that is, is unclear. I, you know, I don't, actually don't know, um, but I imagine you're correct. And I imagine there's some machinations with the financial community because what's happened to a place like Puerto Rico is that it's become a huge site of uh, American financial interests. Um, and uh, that have put a lot of their money into the island um, and they like to have full control and they like to buy local politicians um, and they like to do all these things that if they if Puerto Rico became a state it'd be harder to do right so there is a kind of economic uh, elite that um, has an interest in keeping things the way they are in Puerto Rico and so um, I, I would I would not be surprised if they also actively campaign against any movement towards statehood. Do do we have any more questions? Uh, Okay, here's one. Um, I wonder what motivates people living in territories to join the US military. Yeah, that's also a good question. Um, and one of the things that the military um, sometimes does is promise citizenship, full citizenship. Um, there's also, you know, economic benefits and uh, most of these territories are impoverished, right? Um, Puerto Rico has had historically, uh, repeatedly high unemployment rates. Um, and in many ways, the military is, is another economic option, right? Um, and so in some ways it's like um, the only real choice that a lot of people might have. Um, so I think economic pressures are, are really important. Um, for, for, for people to join the military. I don't want to minimize the people that volunteer out of a sense of service, mm -hmm. um, but I, I do want to recognize the reality of, um, of, of the, the dire economic situation in these territories, particularly a territory like uh, Puerto Rico and how the military can provide at least some temporary way out. I, I would guess that the reasons are as varied as they are for um, anyone living in the state. Anyone, yeah. Yeah. But I, I just heard, I could be wrong on my territory, but I just heard that um, I think it's American Samoa has the highest per capita enlistment rate of anywhere. American Samoa, oh, yeah. Yeah, of um, anywhere. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Puerto Rico sends the most sheer numbers, but that's just because Puerto Rico has bigger population. Yeah. But I think in terms of rate, I think you're right, um, American Samoa. Um, and um, I do, I believe that if American, because uh, American Samoa, they have this national, st U.S. nationals status as opposed to citizenship. I think that if they serve, I, I, I may be wrong, I have to look it up, but I, I'm pretty sure that um, if you serve in the military, you can then shift from national status to citizenship status, maybe. Um, and that might be an, uh, also uh, an attraction. Um. Okay, wait, we've got one more. Someone's, someone's chatting to me personally, but um, given that we are talking about primarily islands, how is climate change impacting relations with U.S. territories? Or perhaps it must be terrifying not to have a policy voice when your existence is threatened. That's a really, that's a really great question. And this is one of those um, examples of sort of environmental colonialism and injustice, right? Um, these islands don't have a voice. The federal government doesn't really care about the uh, environment in these islands. And you know, Puerto Rico for a long time was a site of 
uh, American military movements and, and training and sort of uh, devastating a lot of, you know, the literal bombing. They would do bombing tests um, in these territories. Um, and so environment has never been a concern. Um, and with, you know, um, rising sea levels and all those other concerns, uh, a lot of scientists in these territories are, yeah, they're absolutely appalled and there's very little they can do. Um, uh, you know, the local governments of Puerto Rico, they could do something theoretically and they, they could do some policies. But um, I, I, I think that there's uh, just as much uh, resistance to and proper environmental policies in these territories as there is in the United States, really. Um, and then... Um, and then to even have less power than typical citizens is, is really difficult. So the environmental issue is a, is a really important one. It's increasingly important. And there actually, frankly, hasn't been a whole lot of discussion about it. Thank you. OK, I'm going to throw out one final question, and then we will bid adieu. Um, and, and this is not really in your wheelhouse as an academic, but could you identify any allies for territories who uh, are in Congress and have um, some influence? Is there anyone working on behalf of the territories um, to get better representation? I mean, besides obviously the non-voting representatives yeah. themselves. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know exactly, but I, uh, as I sort of hinted, I, I do think that um, the Democratic Party is um, could be brought around to becoming um, open to status issues and towards statehood issues for Puerto Rico, for example. Um, part of the, I mean, part of the problem is that the Democratic Party also has a lot of some interests, some financial interests that might be opposed to that. Um, but if it's if there's going to be NA allies, it's going to be within within the the left wing of the Democratic Party, I would say. Um, I don't know what Bernie Sanders' status standing uh, was on Puerto Rico, for instance, but um, uh, in the past, you know, I remember Jesse Jackson being very open. Um, so, you know, certain parts of the Democratic Party is really the closest ally that I could imagine in terms of traditional representation and traditional electoral politics. So if, if anything is going to happen, I would have to say um, it, would it should happen within the Democratic Party. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. We have, we've planned this over um, many life changes for all of us. And um, I just appreciate you joining us from Chicago tonight and this afternoon for you. Um, and Paula, we'll see you in a couple of weeks um, right here from my pantry. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. Thank you.